Hi and welcome to another episode of our series Research in Profile brought to you by the School of Political Science and International Studies at the University of Queensland. My name is Dr. Sebastian Kempf and I'm joined here by my colleague Dr. Phil Orchard. Phil is a senior lecturer in Peace and Conflict Studies and International Relations and also the research director of the Asia Pacific Center for the Responsibility to Protect. Now Phil has just published his latest book called A Right to Flee, Refugees, States and the Construction of International Cooperation. It's of course a very timely topic and so welcome Phil and thank you for joining us here. With the book of that title I'm of course curious to find out more as to what got you interested in this particular topic, A Right to Flee. Well, it actually started a long time ago. Um, this is a project that I've really been working on off and on for 15 years. And it began, uh, I had finished my master's and I went to work at the United Nations, uh, looking specifically at internally displaced persons issues, people who had fled their own homes but remained within their own country. And day to day, working in the UN in New York, I saw all sorts of activities around forced migrants, around refugees, around IDPs. And yet my training in IR that I'd got in my master's, my bachelor's degrees, had never touched on forced migrants as an issue for international cooperation or for something that needed an international focus. And so really that, that triggered this interest in me in studying these issues. And that led me to go back and, and do a doctoral dissertation, which was originally gonna be on IDPs, on internally displaced persons alone. Um, and then I realized as I got more and more into the history of refugees, that there had been so little written on them at the time. Uh, there's been more work done in international relations on refugees issues today. But at the time there was so little out there that I really realized that I needed to do something more comprehensive looking at them before I moved on to look at IDP issues. Great. And so by, the, by starting to write this mm -hmm. book, what were the puzzles, the mm -hmm. theoretical and conceptual puzzles that mm -hmm. drove your research? Yeah. Well, I guess there were really two puzzles that I encountered. One was sort of the question of how refugees and forced migrants fit into IR theory. And, and the bigger question was how we actually look at refugees and how we understand their history. Um, to touch actually on the second question first, th there had been a lot of work looking at refugees um, from sociology, from history, and so on. And much of that work tended to focus on sort of the post-1951 period, when the UN High Commissioner of Refugees had been created, when the 1951 Refugee Convention had been negotiated. Very little work had looked at uh, refugee efforts prior to that time, and that was really something that, that intrigued me. How do we understand this prehistory or past history of refugee movements? Because, of course, we can point to flight existing throughout history. Whether we're looking at religious or territorial-based notions of asylum, we can trace them back to the ancient Greeks. And really, in the modern period, we can see key developments around how we understand refugees emerging a really long time ago. You know, as far back as the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, where we see the first statement of uh, people having a right of jus amagande, uh, as laid out within the Peace of Westphalia, the right to leave their own home with their property if their religion differed from that of their ruler. And so you have this very long history from 1648 to the 20th century, which just hadn't really been examined before. And so that was really one of the puzzles that motivated me. How can we understand basic norms, basic understandings around refugees developing over time? But the other question, as I mentioned, was uh, how refugees fit within IR theory. Because you could see uh, a typical series of explanations around why refugees mattered. One, very much a realist explanation, was that it was primarily being driven by state interests so that we could see those developments I mentioned, the Refugee Convention, UNHCR, and so on developing, primarily because it was in the U.S. interest at the time, that they saw refugees as people who could vote with their fleet, fleeing the communist world, fleeing the Soviet Union, fleeing Eastern Europe. Now, that explanation actually explains fairly well why we'd have a strong international refugee regime created during the Cold War period, but that explanation would also suggest that we should just see it cease when it's no longer in the US interest to support it. And certainly in the post-Cold War period, we see dramatic changes in how refugees are dealt with, but we don't see states simply stopping to cooperate. We don't see the US, for example, suddenly ceasing to resettle refugees. In fact, the United States is the single, uh, is the country that resettles the most refugees today, some 70,000 per year. 
Other explanations existed as well, one primarily around the idea of stability, that what we see, of course, with refugee flows is large numbers of people fleeing their own states, potentially destabilizing other states and potentially destabilizing the international system as a whole if they have big enough numbers. Now, a stability argument, similarly, that there's some good evidence for it, there's some good history for it, but that doesn't explain why we have the current regime that we do, how these regimes got set up over time. And so really, when I got to work on this project, what I found was that there were these two issues that I really began to understand were in fact th the same issue itself, the same puzzle. The question of how states had actually developed refugee protection, how their understandings had originated, and how their understandings had evolved over the question of refugee protection over time. Great. And just maybe as a matter of clarification, mm -hmm. I mean, you, 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 you use the terms refugees, mm -hmm. forced migration interchangeably. Um, but it's a book that is not just about refugees. It's also about the, the sort of even larger group of forced mm -hmm. um, migrants today, IDPs, internally displaced persons. And that features in your book as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I think w one of the things as we look at this long history, we have to understand how refugee protection has evolved as an issue. And what we can actually see is that basic core understandings about who refugees are have changed dramatically over time. Um, I mentioned earlier the idea of the Peace of Westphalia. And a real triggering moment after that Peace of Westphalia in 1648 was Louis XIV's revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685. This was the revocation of the rights of the Huguenot population of France, of the Protestant population of France, to be treated equally along with the Catholic population. Now, not only did that cause 200,000 Huguenots to flee, the first group that were actually called refugees, but in addition, it led to a wide outcry across Europe because Louis XIV attempted to prohibit them from leaving. And it's from that moment that we actually see the idea that refugees are separate or distinct from ordinary migrants, that they need some form of protection and that that other form of protection should be provided in law. So in that period, we see initially states introduce domestic legal standards to deal with the Huguenot flows. Other flows over the next century, similarly religious in nature, were smaller, but were generally addressed and handled by a single state at the time, in each case. As we move in the 19th century, we then see political refugees become important and the same set of rights extended to them. Anchored first in domestic law, in domestic legislation, a core set of states, including the US, the UK, and France, and then this being extended across European international society through the mechanism of bilateral extradition law. That basically those three countries simply wouldn't sign extradition treaties if other states weren't willing to extend protections to political refugees. Now that's still all at the bilateral level. There's no multilateral cooperation. There's no international law. There's no international organizations on these points. And that's really the big shift that happens in the 20th century. And it happens in the interwar period with the League of Nations. Um, the First World War, of course, had created millions of refugees. So we go from a system where we had tens of thousands of political refugees and hundreds of thousands of religious refugees. Re religious refugees during the 19th century were generally able to move on. They were generally able to flow through Europe because of policies of open migration. With the First World War, of course, that open migration policy shuts down and the number of political refugees increased dramatically. Two million refugees, for example, fleeing the Soviet Union after the Russian Revolution. So we see dramatic increases in numbers and this previous sort of informal system of cooperation, this tacit regime that existed in the 19th century, simply blows apart. It doesn't work anymore. And this is when we see the first move to multilateral cooperation through the League of Nations and particularly through the role of Friedrich Nansen, who's the first High Commissioner of Refugees, sort of one of those larger than life figures you see in history. This guy had been a polar explorer, um, had a, 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 at the time traveled the farthest towards the North Pole that anyone had in, in history, um, gives up exploring and becomes an international diplomat. Um, by the time he became the High Commissioner of Refugees, he had international stature and he had already successfully negotiated a prisoner of war agreement with the Soviet Union, the first international agreement that they had negotiated during that time period. Um, so he comes in and he basically says what these Russian refugees need is they, they need some form of legal protection that we can't provide it at the domestic level. So what we'll do is we'll create international law, what was called the arrangement system, whereby first Russian refugees, then Armenian refugees and other groups were extended so-called Nansen passports, 
by the League of Nations, allowing them to travel to other states. The problem with that system is it only applied to a few groups, and it was fairly rickety. The League of Nations, of course, was a relatively weak organization, and it really couldn't handle the political turmoil of the 1930s, and particularly the rise of uh, Nazism in Germany. And what we see from 1933 onwards is that the League of Nations doesn't know how to respond to the German-Jewish problem, to respond to the Jewish refugees fleeing from Germany. They first seek to extend uh, some forms of protection through a separate independent organization, and it's only by 1938 that they decide to bring that separate independent organization back within League architecture. But by then, no one's paying attention to the League anymore. It doesn't matter. And even efforts by the United States government to create a separate process through a conference held in Avion, France in, in 1938 uh, doesn't pan out either. And unfortunately, you know, that's really one, one of the darkest periods when we look at this refugee history, because it's in that moment that we can basically point to about 200 to 300,000 German Jews who were unable to leave Germany during this time period and who all died during the Holocaust. Um, that really led to dramatic changes and led in the post-war period to this real push to create a consolidated international refugee regime, one where legal protection was clearly enshrined in an international convention and where you had a succession of different international organizations designed to provide assistance and protection to refugees. Um, UNHCR emerges in 1951 following from the UN Relief and Rehabilitation Administration and then the International Relief Refugee Organization. UNHCR, it's interesting, is actually given a relatively weak mandate. It's not meant to be an assistance organization when it starts out. But it's through the 1950s, and particularly as Cold War politics play an increasing role, that UNHCR expands its role fairly dramatically, first convincing the United States and other governments that it can effectively provide assistance, and then also convincing states to move away from what had been established as a very Eurocentric regime. The initial 1951 Refugee Convention didn't actually apply to situations after 1951, and states could decide whether it applied only to European refugees or European and other refugees. By 1967, of course, that system doesn't work anymore, and UNHCR successfully redefines it, amending the convention through the refugee protocol. So really you see sort of this story go through history where we see these gradual norms emerge around the idea of legal protection being anchored first at the domestic and then at the international level, and around the need for strong, robust, independent international organizations. Um, now, of course, you mentioned the IDP question, and that's really one of the biggest shifts that we've seen in the last 20, 20 to 25 years since the end of the Cold War, that states have increasingly engaged in what's been referred frequently to the containment agenda, that they've sought to limit the number of asylum seekers they receive and to contain refugees to their regions or even countries of origin. So while refugees hit a high point in 1992 of 17.8 million, they've declined fairly significantly and been fairly stable, though over the last few years we've seen a, a steady increase due primarily to Syria. By contrast, the number of IDPs in the international system has continued to grow dramatically, reaching 38 million uh, this past year. And so really what we've seen is that states, in seeking to limit their obligation towards refugees, have introduced what I refer to as a series of extraterritorial efforts to deter and prevent asylum seekers from actually accessing their own asylum systems. And that has meant that we've seen the steady increase in IDPs and the steady increase in people who can't actually get status, even though they do qualify under the Refugee Convention. Well, there's a tour de force through, through history here as well, and I suspect that the reader will be taken through mm. some of those very significant mm. pivotal moments in the history of... Um, the it's a big book. <laughs> it's a big book uh, in the history of the, the right to flee. Um, if we... Um, can shed a bit of light into what the actual findings are. Mm -hmm. The reader who will have now read through and hopefully will read through mm -hmm. the entire book, uh, but if you can get us a reader's digest on what are the, the pivotal findings mm -hmm. of your book. Well, I think it's, it's important to note that we've refugees are always with us and we always need some form of arrangement to actually respond to refugees. And what we can see over this long history is different efforts by states to cooperate around the refugee problem. Um, and so what we've seen is a series of different regimes, as I put it, regimes that frame these norms, these shared understandings around who refugees are and how they should be protected, which have evolved and changed over time. 
So I think there's an important finding there in terms of how we deal with IR theory, particularly the idea of norms and regimes, um, how these sort of so-called structures or social facts as John Scheele has called them, are understood not just by us as individuals, but also by states and international organizations, non-governmental organizations, and other actors operating at the international level. Beyond that, though, I think there's a steady story of understanding that when refugee protection fails, how spectacularly it can fail. Um, the 1930s period demonstrates this well, that when that basic understanding of asylum breaks down, when states aren't willing to provide it, we can see uh, huge, significant, and disastrous consequences. Um, since the end of the Cold War, I think we've seen states really wrestling with the refugee question. We've seen states wrestle with the idea of increased refugee numbers, both globally, but also as asylum seekers reaching the developed world in a way that they really hadn't, driven in part by te increased technology, but also by increased conflict. And I think we've seen a steady period of states um, successfully actually limiting their obligations as much as they can. The Refugee Convention isn't actually that friendly a document to refugees. It's focused primarily on the idea of individualized persecution by a state, that the state is deliberately targeting you. It doesn't apply well in situations of generalized violence like civil wars. It doesn't apply well if you're being persecuted by a non-state actor. It also doesn't apply well if you're in a mass atrocities event where you're not being individually persecuted, but rather um, persecuted as part of a group. Because of that, that means the Refugee Convention actually doesn't apply to a lot of circumstances that we see today that create refugees. We see a mixture of different laws at the regional level that provide better standards, and generally individual states themselves generally provide more robust standards through their own domestic law than the Refugee Convention itself does. But what this has meant is that states have really successfully limited their obligations to refugees and that they've sought to do so effectively. It's a sobering, some might say, a bit of a sad story and insight, but since you mentioned um, the, well, the, the situation of forced migration mm -hmm. that has um, received so many uh, news headlines mm -hmm. in particular this, this time around the Mediterranean, around mm -hmm. the situation here in Australia, but also over the um, civil war and conflict in Syria mm -hmm. slash Iraq. I mean, using your findings from the book and mm -hmm. the implications that you alluded to with regards to how we should think about international politics, can you shed a bit of light, maybe as mm -hmm. the final point here, like how would you make sense and interpret that current situation mm -hmm that has, has been grabbing so many of the headlines today. Yes, yes, unfortunately, uh, you know, we can look at the crisis in the Mediterranean, we can look at the crisis in the, with the Rohingya people fleeing Myanmar, and what we see is uh, really this extraterritorial idea of the international refugee regime, which I mentioned earlier. This is effectively the idea that individual states um, accept still that they have an obligation under the Refugee Convention to deal with refugees and asylum seekers which reach their territory. But that if they can use mechanisms to either deter, to convince them to go elsewhere, or to literally block them from reaching that territory, that that obligation doesn't apply. And so what we've seen is on top of sort of the existing post-war international refugee regime, we've seen layered this level of extraterritorial control that which just didn't exist before. And that really dates back uh, and actually to the early 1990s, where uh, the United States government began uh, interpreting the non-refoulement provision within the Refugee Convention. Non-refoulement refers to the idea that refugees cannot be forcibly returned to their own country or to a country which might forcibly return them uh, again to their home country. Um, the US interpreted that provision very narrowly in terms of Haitian and Cuban refugees fleeing across the Mediterranean. Um, arguing to the U.S. Supreme Court, which the U.S. Supreme Court accepted, um, that that non-refoulement provision didn't apply outside of U.S. territorial waters. Um, and then in subsequent policy, they actually moved to, it didn't apply if you weren't on U.S. physical territory. Um, if uh, you've heard the, the, the dr dry foot, wet foot rule, that's where that comes from. The idea that as soon as you step foot on U.S. territory, you have a much greater range of protection than if you're at sea, even if you're sitting in Miami Harbor. Um, and that's one understanding of non-refoulement where basically even though U.S. authorities were intercepting boats 
and had control over the individuals, it was US Navy vessels or Coast Guard vessels intercepting them, that they didn't have the same rights as other refugees would within the US system. Um, and that's really the precedent that informs Australian policy. The idea that just because the Australian state has de facto control over individuals, um, that it doesn't need to provide them the full rights under the Refugee Convention. Um, interestingly enough, the EU has a different standard. The European Court of Human Rights, in, in a powerful decision, found that the Italian government had enacted a similar system, working with uh, the Libyan government under when Gaddafi was still in charge. In that case, though, uh, the European Court ruled that the Italian government was actually in violation of its right requirements under the Refugee Convention because there they made the decision that even though they had control over the refugees, they wouldn't process them, they would return them to Libya. According to the European Court on Human Rights, it didn't matter. That the Italian th authorities, because they had control over those individuals, they needed to ensure that they had full rights under the Refugee Convention. Um, so uh, a couple months ago, Tony Abbott argued that the European Union should apply an Australian-made solution, should apply what Australia's been doing to the Mediterranean crisis, and in the legal environment, that simply wouldn't work there. It wouldn't be acceptable under the European Convention. Interestingly enough, there's also a cost issue there. Um, this is one of the untold stories about Australia's policies, is that it's, they're incredibly expensive. Um, they're running hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars per asylum seeker um, who are transferred into uh, detention camps in Papua New Guinea and on the uh, Pacific island of Nauru. Um, to enact a similar solution to deal with the Mediterranean crisis would cost the European Union some $85 billion a year. Wow. Uh, so that's why I don't think it's gonna happen there either. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, uh, these extraterritorial controls do mean that we see uh, reticence on the part of governments being willing to accept uh, asylum seekers. And I think that's really why we've seen attempts to negotiate a common resettlement framework within the European Union over the last few months continue to break down. Wow, Phil, this is a very insightful, very rich uh, mm, thanks. path you've taken us through here. And no doubt that path will be so much richer once you get a chance to pick up this book and, and also <laughs> read it to which, uh, which I would strongly encourage you to do. You can find the details for Phil's book uh, under this video in the same way that you can find the details for all the stuff we do here in the School of Political Science and International Studies. For now, thanks Phil for joining us and uh, thank you very much.